Well, hello and welcome to the WALPA Wellbeing Forum. Good evening. My name is Julia McCrossan and it's my pleasure uh, to be your host this evening at this Living Well with Osteoarthritis Non-Surgical Methods Maintaining Joint Health and Reducing Disability and Pain. And, and we're very pleased to say this has been one of our most popular webinars, so this is clearly a topic you're, you have a tremendous interest in. This webinar this evening is hosted by Walper Jewish Hospital and Friends of Walper, and we're also very happy to welcome our partner, Arthritis Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging we're broadcasting on Aboriginal land, the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Just as more people are coming in, I'll give you some quick housekeeping. Remember that questions are welcome and thank you to the many members of our audience who've already submitted questions in advance. Uh, but uh, you can ask questions throughout our time this evening in the Q&A section. We can't see or hear you. You need to write them in the Q&A section. And our question moderator this evening is Dr. Alan Shell. We're enormously pleased to welcome Alan back with us this evening. Uh, a very experienced general practitioner, a founder of this marvellous uh, webinar series, uh, originally face-to-face, -face, of course, uh, over 20 years ago. So welcome back to Alan. He'll be moderating the questions as they come in, and I'll be inviting him regularly uh, onto our webinar to ask questions uh, of our panel members. Uh, all uh, questions will be asked anonymously. Obviously, we can't answer personal clinical questions, but we will go uh, to the heart of the matter and give you a good quality general answer. And uh, I should say for people who are joining us for the first time tonight that our host tonight, Wobber Jewish Hospital, uh, is uh, provides rehabilitation, medical and palliative care to everyone in the community, a, a substantial majority, I think, of non-Jewish uh, patients, but within a framework of Jewish values and religious and dietary requirements. Well, now it's my pleasure to welcome our partner for the evening, Arthritis Australia, and Krista Sutherland-Smith is going to join us, Consumer Information and Resource Manager. Welcome to you, Krista. Oh, well, thank you so much, Julie, and hello, everybody. Um, my name's Krista. Um, I work with Arthritis Australia as a Consumer Information Resource Manager, and I've been with the association now for, oh, I'd say, about 12 months. I have over about 25 years of clinical experience as a registered nurse as a pa in paediatrics, high dependency, acute care, and of course, perioperative services as well. The interesting thing about holding these roles is that um, I've tapped into the consumer resource area and really got a, a good handle on the witness on witnessing and understanding the true burden of disease of arthritis across Australia. I'm also personally affected by osteoarthritis myself in my neck following a substantial MVA in 2016, which was not nice, um, landing me in the ICU at Royal North Shore Hospital for a good couple of weeks and then a subsequent long haul rehabilitation, as I'm sure we can all appreciate. So I, at times, treatment options are quite difficult. They, they can be daunting and accessing, accessing effective management techniques can be nuanced. So this is why I've dedicated the latter part of my career to improving the health literacy of those affected by this condition and help them gain a better understanding of osteoarthritis and how to access proven resources. So who are we? Arthritis Australia. So we are the national peak body and leading charity in Australia for arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions. We work in collaboration with our affiliated organisations, including an office in um, the ACT, New South Wales, Northern Territory, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania and Western Australia, so all over Australia, which is fantastic, unfortunately, aside from Victoria. We do deliver information resources to people living with arthritis and over the 100 different types of arthritis. We also provide um, leading, we are the lead in non-government funders for arthritis research. We advocate to the government and industry for policies, programs and funding initiatives also. We develop partnerships with national organisations that align with values and fund support our activities. We also work collaboratively with those affiliate organisations that I mentioned just earlier and other peak organisations to help improve the well-being of all people living with arthritis. 
So in terms of consumer support, um, our website is a comprehensive site that actually has quite a number of consumer information resources. And we disseminate these resources across Australia via our state affiliate offices, um, enabling them to directly reach consumers right at the cold face, which is fantastic. Um, the resources are all developed, researched and reviewed within a two to three yearly recycle period, not recycle, sorry, cycle period, um, depending on the type of resource. And our newest re one of our newest resources, which I was part of um, developing, is a management booklet on how to manage pain in arthritis, which is quite pertinent for osteoarthritis um, sufferers or people living with osteoarthritis. Um, we also have a heavy presence in the research space across the National Research Program, Paediatric Rheumatology Scholarships, and surprisingly, there's only 20 current paediatric rheumatologists operating or actually servicing the community across all of Australia. So the current shortfall is actually 41 paediatric rheumatologists. So Arthritis Australia are working really hard to offer scholarships to paediatricians who are looking to um, pursue a career in paediatric rheumatology. We also do the promotion of research studies and other clinical trials, and all of that information can be found on our website also for people wanting to participate in clinical research and or other trials. We also do investment into impactful research. By commissioning Research Australia, we have been able to derive a national strategy for arthritis research, including detailed review of the research um, landscape and funding allocations, um, presenting that into government and hopefully we'll be seeing some good results from that. We also have a heavy presence in the advocacy and policy space um, across government, business, industry and community leaders to improve the care, management and support and quality of life for people living with arthritis. We also participate in um, government consultations and prepare submissions to government agencies on a range of issues affecting people with arthritis. In 2024 and only recently, myself and the team at Arthritis Australia submitted a budget for equitable and affordable support for Australia's one of Australia's most common health care or sorry health conditions. We also have a strong focus in sustainability. Um, by digitising our assets and our resources, we're able to link more Australians to live, who are living with arthritis to these health, in, health information resources, education and other support services, again, through our affiliates. So in saying all of that, we have a lot of work that we do at Arthritis Australia. We are a very small charity, but we are working very hard with a number of other people in order to free people from arthritis and hopefully work towards a cure. So stay in touch with us. We do have a national arthritis information line and that number I'm more than happy to post or we, I can say that now if you have a pen handy and wanted to take it down. It's 1800 011 041. It's the national geolocated number that you can actually call and speak to a trained professional about advice and information on living well with arthritis. I wish everybody the very best and enjoy the rest of the panel with these esteemed wonderful panellists and have a wonderful afternoon and evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krista. That, that was very informative. And uh, as I was telling our team just before we started, I have uh, joined a group on Arthritis Australia's website to, to get information myself about osteoarthritis. And we will be sending uh, to everyone who's registered this evening uh, a recording of our webinar this evening, but also uh, uh, digital links to a whole range of resources, obviously including Arthritis Australia. Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to everyone who's joined us. Just before I invite our panel and we begin, we're going to do a quick live poll so our audience can, our, our panel members can can learn about you. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read a question, you do the answer on screen, and then we give you the immediate answer. So this is a live poll, and I'll ask our technical host, Nat, to put up the first question, please. So what is your gender, male, female, other, uh, prefer not to say? If you could answer that, please. Thanks, Nat. So we have 14% men uh, and 86% women. Thank you. And our next question, uh, goes to the age range, I think, that you fall into, if we could see it. Is your age 39 years or younger, between 40 and 70, 
or 71 or older. So only 1% under 39, 30% uh, between 40 and 70, 69% uh, uh, 71 years or older. Thank you very much. Our next question, please, Nat. I'm just hoping for our next question to come up. This is about pain. Do painful joints, especially in the feet, ankles, knees, hips, or back, make it harder for you to exercise? Yes, no, sometimes. Forty-four percent yes, twelve percent no, forty-four percent sometimes. So uh, uh, nearly uh, well, uh, well over eighty percent uh, are experiencing some difficulties. Uh, thank you. Our next one, please. Does osteoarthritis cause you to experience, and you can answer as many as you like, poor sleep due to pain, restrictions in performing daily tasks, trips and falls? anxiety and depression, loss of independence, all of the above. Let's see how we're going now. Poor sleep, 52%. Restrictions in daily tasks, 79%. Trips and falls, 9%. Anxiety and depression, 34%. Loss of independence, 14%. All of the above, 9%. I think we have two more questions, so let's go to our next one. Do you experience stiffness and loss of flexibility? Multiple choice. When you wake up, after prolonged sitting at other times, never. And obviously you can add some more than one. So uh, stiffness and loss of flexibility, I'm waking up 66% after prolonged sitting 76% at other times, 37% and never, 7%. And now do we have one more? Um, or is that the last one? Yes. Lifestyle. Does osteoarthritis, and again, you can answer multiple ones, influence your lifestyle, such as diet and exercise choices, influence the type of holidays you plan, affect your family plans and dreams, create concern for your future, such as your ability to be independent, all of the above. And uh, I think we'll just say thank you to see what people have said. So influencing lifestyle choice, such as diet and exercise, 58%. Influencing types of holidays, 41%. Affecting pl family plans and dreams, 20%. Creating concern for the future, such as ability to be independent, 64%. All of the above. 23%. Look, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I think our audience, uh, our panel, who I'd like to invite now, Nat, to bring uh, onto the screen for us all to meet, have a very uh, clear picture, I think, of the uh, the nature uh, of the people uh, who are listening to us tonight. And I'm just going on to gallery view myself. So good evening and welcome. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, through the Q&A function, you can give live questions and our general practitioner, question moderator, Dr. Alan Schell will be coming on regularly uh, to share your questions. Well, let me welcome our panel for Living Well with Osteoarthritis with a primary focus on non-surgical methods, maintaining joint health and reducing disability and pain. It's welcome to Professor David Hunter, a rheumatologist and clinical researcher. I'll give a fuller introduction uh, when I bring him on screen. 
Karen Pratt, who's a physiotherapist and a musculoskeletal coordinator of a marvellous service at Royal North Shore Hospital. Uh, Dr. John Best, a specialist sports and exercise uh, medicine physician. And uh, I'd also like to welcome Cody Kane, who's a physiotherapist and the manager of physiotherapy and day programs at Walpa. This is deaf sign clapping, ladies and gentlemen. Do, would you like to deaf sign clap just as a way of uh, welcoming yourselves? It's also an immensely encouraging thing to see uh, when you're in the audience. It really is deaf sign clapping. I'd like to come to, to Professor David Hunter first, rheumatologist and clinical researcher. He's the Florence and Cope Chair of Rheumatology at the University of Sydney and the co-director of the Sydney Musculoskeletal Health flagship. Uh, welcome to you, uh, Professor Hunter. What is a rheumatologist? Just quickly tell us that speciality, please. Julie, thank you so much for having me along. And obviously, thank you to, to Warper Jewish Hospital for the privilege to speak to the guests today. So a rheumatologist essentially is a medical specialist, a physician who specializes in care of disorders of bone, joint and muscle. And most of the focus tends to be on the joint, specifically conditions of arthritis, such as osteoarthritis. And I've noticed musculoskeletal. It shows you uh, we're, we're working on the health of the muscle as much as the, the skeleton. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the, the key thing, particularly to understand about diseases like osteoarthritis, is it's a disease of the whole joint. Um, and so part of that joint would include muscles, ligaments, tendons, as well as obviously what people understand as cartilage and bone and, and other structures that lie within the joint. So all of those tissues are important to the development of disease, but it's also its ongoing management. And give us a, def a definition of osteoarthritis and its sort of key symptoms, please. Yeah, so osteoarthritis is a disease affecting, as I, as I mentioned, potentially all of the tissues of a synovial joint. And most of the joints throughout the body are a synovial joint, meaning that they, they move. And the most common joints that are primarily affected in this condition tend to be knees, hips, and hands. And often for many people who have it, it's a systemic problem, meaning it affects uh, multiple joints. And the most common way it presents is with pain emanating from the joint that's affected, usually that's activity related in the first instance. So in contrast to a more inflammatory arthritis where you may get more pain at rest and stiffness associated with prolonged inactivity. Osteoarthritis, particularly in the first instance, is an activity related or what we call mechanical based pain. And that often leads to limitations in activities. So, you know, particularly uh, exercise activities and other activities of daily living. And I, obviously we have a, an old, predominantly older audience who are keen to get help with, with pain and, and so on. But I just want to ask how significant a health issue is it nationally to our society, osteoarthritis? Yeah, so it's, I mean, I obviously have an inherent bias here, Julie, but I think it's one of the biggest health problems facing our community at the moment. So 3 million Australians have osteoarthritis, about 500 million people around the world. And when we look at the causes of disability in our community, this consistently ranks within the top 10 causes of disability in our community. And the impact on a person's life, I mean, we have a sense from that survey, but the impact that it can have. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the, the most telling uh, quotes that I hear about this actually came from a survey from Arthritis Australia. Um, for two in three people that have osteoarthritis, the last time they were pain-free was over a year ago. So I think when you put it in those sorts of terms about the impact of pain, uh, the the uh, the limitations that this has on activities, whether that be participation in the community, participation in sport, playing with your grandkids, whatever it might be, is immense. And in addition, and this is probably in contrast to, I guess, most people's perceptions of the disease, about two thirds of the people who are affected are of working age. And as a consequence of that, this is one of the leading causes of premature work loss. And that has huge implications economically for those people that are involved in terms of uh, income potential and the risk of being in poverty. Look, I know um, I want to ask you one more thing. We'll have a, a little from each of our panel and then dive into our, our, our audience questions. But when I spoke to you, you said we need to empower people to manage their own disease, stay active, get strong and maintain healthy weight. 
does that go to both the management of the condition as well as prevention? To tell us, you know, both prevention and management. What are your things you want everybody to hear? And you've seen the sort of difficulties people are in with that survey. Yeah, I mean, so let's talk about prevention first, because it's often ignored. And I think it's to the detriment of our community that is ignored. But about three quarters of a person's risk of developing osteoarthritis of the knee, as one example, relates to two modifiable risk factors. One is obesity or overweight, and the other is joint injury, both of which are eminently preventable and modifiable in our community. And I'm not suggesting that modifying weight in our community is necessarily an easy task, but they are both modifiable and they account for about 75% of the risk of a person developing osteoarthritis. Um, but as you just suggested, by the same token, not only does weight and physical activity and uh, and sport participation play a really important role in prevention, but it really plays a very important role in management. And the core treatments for osteoarthritis consist of enhancing a person's physical activity and encouraging them to be active, trying to optimize muscle strength around the joint that's primarily affected, and maintaining a healthy weight. So those three three things are the core treatments. There's lots of other treatments that are available that get a lot more publicity than those and probably a, a lot harder for people to implement, but they're the core treatments that oftentimes get ignored and neglected to, to everybody's detriment. I want to ask one to you is, the focus tonight is on non-surgical methods of living well with arthritis, osteoarthritis. Why is that important? Why is it important to try to avoid surgical intervention? Yeah, so and this is probably semantics that I should have brought up before, Julie. But I, I prefer not to say non-surgical. I prefer to say lifestyle and behavioural print, primarily because non-surgical sounds a little bit pejorative and it sounds like we're not doing something that could be done that may be better. Um for the vast majority of people who have osteoarthritis, A, they never need surgery, and most do very well long-term if they're provided an opportunity for lifestyle and behavioral change. And there's good trial evidence for that. There's good cohort cohort evidence of that. And so you might say to yourself, well, you know, why don't we just operate and replace everybody's joints? Um, well, firstly, cost. So one, one thing I think it's really important for people to understand is every joint replacement costs our healthcare system on average about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. The average person that has osteoarthritis in their lower limbs has two point seven lower limb joints affected. So that might be two hips and a knee, two knees and a hip. So you can see the cost increases dramatically. But also, surgery carries with it substantial risk. So you know, despite what you may think, one in two hundred people die from a joint replacement, and costs. You know, obviously, there are implications associated with that risk. And similarly, whilst it's a wonderfully cost-effective procedure for the right person at the right time, one in four people that has a knee replacement, their pain is no better at 12 months than what it was preoperatively. So you don't want to roll that dice too many times to find a lot of people who are quite unsatisfied with the procedure. So if you're provided an opportunity to participate in a lifestyle and behavioral management program where we know we can provide benefits to the vast majority of people with little or no risk and substantially less cost, we should be doing that. Look, thank you so much. And I'd like to welcome now uh, Karen Pratt, uh, who's a physiotherapist, as I mentioned, at Royal North Shore Hospital. Uh, she's the musculoskeletal coordinator of the Osteoarthritis Chronic Care Program. Welcome to you. And could you just give us a snapshot of the sort of the range of people or patients that you see in your work, please? Welcome. Oh, thank you, Julie, um, and good, e good evening, everyone. It's an absolute privilege to be here tonight. So um, I guess for me, so I'm a physiotherapist and I manage an osteoarthritis service at Ron Osher Hospital. So this is a chronic disease management program that was established by the Agency of Clinical Innovation and implemented in public hospitals across New South Wales in 2011 to really manage people with hip and knee osteoarthritis. So it's a 9 to 12 12-month program that's delivered over several consultations with multidisciplinary input. So at Ron Osher Hospital, I'm really fortunate that I work with a really specialised team. So we have rheumatologists, so such as Professor David Hunter, we've got physiotherapists, 
occupational therapists, dietitians, social worker orthotists. So we've got this really nice comprehensive team. And the people that I see in our service and manage would be people that would be on a surgical wait list waiting for surgery. So we invite them to participate to hopefully improve the management of their osteoarthritis and better prepare them for surgery and prevent perioperative complications and improve length of stay. Um, but I also have a lot of referrals from specialists such as rheumatologists, endocrinologists, um, geriatricians, um, and as well as um, general practitioners and allied health professionals to really support the long-term management of osteoarthritis. And I guess leveraging off of um, what um, David was saying is that we do want to manage this early on um, in the disease process. We want to support a healthy and active lifestyle. Um, and that's probably the most important thing just to really highlight tonight is that anyone with osteoarthritis has an opportunity to impact the way um, that um, the disease um, progresses. So um, our muscles is one way that we can actually improve the capacity of the joints. So Professor Hunter alluded to the fact that osteoarthritis is a, um, a whole joint problem. And so um, the good news is, is that we've got capacity to influence the way that our joints respond. So it might be like improving the strength of your muscles to perform better um, and maintaining um, functional capacity. Well, I'd like to run through uh, some of the myths that you think need to be busted, if I, if I could do that, Karen. And, and one is that Joint replacement is not inevitable. You think it's important that people realise that and that some of the people on your wait list, because of that multidisciplinary intervention, actually don't go on to have surgery. So just tell us a little bit more about the fact that joint replacement isn't inevitable and neither is deterioration, that you can stay stable. Um, so, yes, I guess um, maybe it's a nice place to st start is thinking about um, the disease trajectory. Um, so um, most people, as David alluded to, actually state um, kind of a steady state trajectory. And it's only really about a small percentage of people that actually deteriorate and warrant the need for joint replacement. So if we're thinking of the context of knee osteoarthritis, it's only about eight to 10% of people who present to their doctor with knee pain that actually then proceed on to joint replacement. So it's a small percentage of people. And so I guess all the evidence that we know about osteoarthritis management, which is really having the confidence to self-manage your condition, feel empowered to make healthy lifestyle changes, um, be physically active, manage your weight and do exercise, all of these can influence the way that your knee responds. And so there's a good opportunity for you to improve um, the management of your symptoms, such as pain and function. And you say exercise is safe, that that's a, a message you want everyone to hear tonight. It's healthy for the joint to move and take weight, even if you're experiencing pain. Yes. Safe. I definitely can. So I think uh, a lot of the people that I see in the clinic, um, um, they're worried about their joint and it's almost kind of counterintuitive. It hurts. And so there can be this little bit of a vicious cycle where you're in pain and so you're avoiding activities because you're worried about your joint getting worse. And over time, you might have a flare up and then you do less activity um, and then you find that you're joint becomes weaker um, and so you do less and um, maybe this impacts um, your sleep and you're having night pain and you're worried about what your future looks like and then perhaps this might impact um, on uh, I guess the your experience of pain as well some people find that it impacts their mood and they, they're really worried about their condition so they do less because they just want to protect the joint in fact you actually get worse and it's a little bit of a vicious cycle and so in terms of exercise we've actually found it improves the health of the joint if we're talking about healthy bones um talking about muscles and ligaments and tendons, they all need some weight bearing and stimulus on them to improve the health of the joint. It helps with the nutrition. Um, it helps really kind of with the rejuvenation process. And so I'm here to say that movement, general everyday movement is really safe and healthy. And in fact, in the long term, improves pain management. It's interesting the number of people who reported anxiety and depression and, and uh and fear of, of losing their independence. So 
this really is a critical issue, isn't it, to keep moving. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, a lot of the people that I do see um, do suffer from um, psychological conditions like anxiety and depression. And unfortunately, that can actually impact the experience of pain as well. So I think it's really important to support people. We're just having a problem with your sound, uh, Karen. We just lost you there for a second. Can I just ask you to speak again? I want to ask you one more thing. Are you there? Sorry, I think I may have lost you, Julie. Um, I know. We're back again. Where would you like me to? Okay. I know. All is well. We're, all is well. Let me just ask you one more question. You, you mentioned, uh, I, would, I just wanted to make the point, that my understanding is exercise is good for mood. Exercise seems to be good for everything, to be honest, but exercise is good for mood. And so uh, uh, that's another critical reason to address that anxiety and depression. Uh, but you also told me that pain is complex. And you were talking there about people experience pain differently. Just a little bit more on that, please. Yes. Um, so I guess um, pain um, is not a predictor of damage. It um, acts as a protector of either real or perceived um, damage. So it is very complicated and there are lots of things that can impact on your pain experience. So we know that mood can impact your pain experience, poor sleep um, can impact your pain, um, as well as lots of other factors. So genetics and personal personality, so your, your emotions, your environment, um, sometimes a little bit of the physiology as well and your activity, whether you're doing too little or too much, um, there's lots of different impactors on pain. And so it's just to note that in the context of osteoarthritis, um, the pain doesn't mean that you're causing damage. So that's a really important note. Look, thank you. I must say, as someone who sometimes walks alone and sometimes walks in a group, I feel like I experience less pain walking in a group. And it just must be something about the group experience. But look, let me welcome now, thank you so much, Karen. And of course, we'll hear from you again. But let me welcome now Dr. John Best, uh, the specialist sports and exercise medicine physician uh, who works with the Ortho Sports Group in Sydney. And uh, John has had a, a lot of experience, I know, with elite sport, with the Wallabies and now with uh, rugby league. And if you could just help those Wallabies just a little bit more. Or if you could, John, I mean, that's just a small comment. Um, and I know my, my, my mother says the same thing, Julie. It's yeah, all right. No, yeah. I'll never give up. I'm always watching. Um, but I know you also have a keen uh, interest in exercise prescriptions and and health promotion. I know you too want to give this message. You can have a healthy and, and vigorous life. Um, Give us a sense of the kind of assessment you would do with a patient who comes to you. Uh, where, and one, how do you diagnose osteoarthritis? Does it always involve uh, the need for an X-ray or other investigations or are there other ways to diagnose it? Uh, and then how do you determine the most effective treatment for the individual? Yeah. Well, thank you, Julian. As uh, David and Karen have introduced us so well, thank you to the Walper Jewish Hospital and Arthritis Australia for putting this on. So my work uh, as a sports and exercise physician um, is, is very, very enjoyable in that um, we prescribe a lot of exercise, but the first thing obviously as any doctor has to do is, is diagnose people. Uh, sport and exercise medicine is relatively new in Australia as a specialty. It's, it's about 30 years old, which is quite new as a specialty. Um, and often people will be referred and I'm in private practice, I'm surrounded by orthopaedic surgeons where I work, um, with people who would have hip pain or knee pain who haven't fully been diagnosed. And as our previous speakers have said, uh, often their life has been interrupted, often um, they've been given a diagnosis that may not be correct. Uh, so there's a lot of fear with that, particularly with pain at night, that creates a lot of fear. People think the worst, that it may be something sinister. So the actual process of taking a good history is quite uh, long. Uh, finding out what people's sports background was helps you understand what their um, expectations are for the future. Um, and then looking at how their symptoms affect them on a daily basis as we've gone through that poll. And there are certain red flags that really... Uh, affect me in terms of severity you then once you diagnose people through 
the story, the physical examination and the appropriate imaging, you then want to grade them. Are they in a mild, moderate or severe category? And there are different ways of grading people. And, and as many of us know in, in the clinical world, you can have some people with shocking x-rays and scans where their function's not too bad and vice versa. So the old saying is you treat people, not their scans. So once you see the person as a whole, find out what it is that they're wanting to do. I think that's a good start. I think it's helpful. And can I just say, my understanding is that you really think people should be properly assessed, but especially men, that you feel men may be slower to come forward uh, uh, to get help. Can you just explain that? Look, we spoke earlier in the week and um, I have a little interest and bias towards men's health. Um, I'm trying to publish a manuscript at the moment on that. But uh, in Australia, only, only one in five men have a regular GP compared to four out of five women. And GPs with the Australian health model are the gatekeepers um, really for our health. They're, they're, they're the best people to go to first for your general health and then depending on what you need, a referral may be, be needed. So I see men who real, who've done a lot of sport, for example, they may have had some sort of injury or trauma such as a knee injury, a, a anterior cruciate ligament, ACL, such as Sam Kerr has just had, or shoulder dislocations, which is a common, the most common cause of osteoarthritis in males of the shoulder. And, and they often don't connect those two, the injury they had when they were young in their teens or 20s and what's going on in their 40s, 50s or beyond. They still think they're in their glory days a little bit as well. So resetting their goals and let them know their life's not finished is very important. And as we've heard, um, exercise therapy, um, weight management, with a lot of education, are quite foundational in all of this. I'll ask you one more thing, and then I might get some questions from our audience, and we'll meet Cody Kane from Walper a little bit later. But I know prevention of frailty is an area of interest and importance to you, and just because of the uh, later age group uh, uh, that is quite large with our audience tonight. What is frailty and how do you prevent it? Hmm. Thank you. Frailty uh, is misunderstood. What it isn't is, is age. It, it's not about getting old. So frailty is a syndrome where you have um, a combination of things that can be measured. So frailty is a combination of physical things such as walking speed, balance, number of falls. And, um, and in addition to that, um, you can be measured through good physical assessment, including things like grip strength and so on. And people who are frail, and with that, there usually is a significant reduction in, in quality muscle, what we call skeletal muscle. If you don't correct that, it's a very strong predict predictor of future problems and their quality of life in the future. So obviously you can see how with age, if you have a problem such as osteoarthritis, particularly in the lower limb, if you're inactive and haven't done the strength work and actually gotten fitter even during that time, your risk of problems are much higher generally. It, it, it's a conundrum. Yeah. And when you say the strength work, what do you mean? Well, exercise therapy, um, I, I have as a trailer on my email, exercise is medicine. Uh, there are different ways of, of exercising, but when we look at training muscles and strengthening muscles, it usually involves some sort of resistance work. It can be done through just muscles being tightened and held. It could be done with bands, your body weight or equipment. And then you've got the length of muscles, the flexibility of them. And the idea of getting stronger as you get old is quite foreign to many people particularly if they haven't had an exercise background. And some patients like, will say to me, you're, you're kidding, doc, you want me to start exercising now? I've escaped it all my life. Yeah. And I say to them, look, um, with all due respect, I don't think that was a good decision. Let's change things now if you want to improve your quality. And the, the research shows that uh, even into your 80s, um, people are quite trainable and there are health benefits with that. Look, thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to now to welcome Dr. Alan Fell, our 
question moderator and experienced general practitioner uh, who's seen the questions in advance, uh, but also uh, um, live questions tonight. So, Alan, can I welcome you to the screen and let's have some questions to our panel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Julie, and thank you, everybody, for being here this evening and welcome to all our uh, viewers. I think the, as a GP, I agree that uh, arthritis and painful joints is a major uh, surveyed uh, problem that comes into general practice every day of the week. So certainly a truism. A number of questions, of course, are talking about the hip and knee joints, but quite an overwhelming number of asking, why do we get flare ups in our fingers and toes and in fact cause us to have serious problems in walking and doing things with our, our hands? Um, is that typical of arthritis or, and also is it typically of the fact that the majority of people watching tonight are women? Is it a genetic predisposition? Could I come to David Hunter first and then I might come to you, Karen, as well and get a physio perspective. Uh, Professor Hunter. Yeah, so it's a great question and a really important question because um, for most people that have osteoarthritis, the disease, particularly in the first instance, is one of episodic symptoms or flare-ups. Um, and so oftentimes when a person first develops disease, it's a pain that's related to a particular activity that they've done that um, maybe yet they're unac unaccustomed to and they get a short duration, you know, maybe two to three days of pain in the joint that's primarily affected. And then they may go for weeks or months without any symptoms, at least in the first instance. But those episodes or flares... Uh, do occur throughout the course of disease, even as a person develops uh, background symptoms. But it's usually the flares that I think people find most disabling because oftentimes they're quite unpredictable. And Alan, the, the second part of your question related to um, genetic predisposition to this. And so particularly for hips and hands and to a much lesser extent knees, there's a strong genetic predisposition to this. And so if we look at the likelihood of a person developing hand or hip osteoarthritis, 50% of that relates to genetic predisposition. So it's not infrequent that you'll see a person who has osteoarthritis in the hands and the characteristic nodes that you might see in the small joints at the end of the fingers, in particularly amongst women, and, and they'll say that, you know, my mother had this or my grandmother had this, and they, they characteristically remember it. So genes do play an important role here. And could I ask you, uh, Professor Hunter, when those flares happen, should you stop moving that we that while it's happening we're getting this bit stay active so do you keep using through the pain is that the general advice yeah the general advice is to stay as active as you can tolerate the longer you sit the more deconditioned the less uh, your muscle continues to work and the worse you'll be long term and so historically there was often advice given to people to to go to bed or to rest or to to lay on the couch until the problem went away. But to be honest, it probably makes a person worse longer term. So our general advice is to stay as active as, in the, as they can tolerate. And oftentimes during these flares, we might encourage people to, to take, um, um, to use a sleeve around the joint that's affected, to use heat or ice, or to potentially use a short course of an anti-inflammatory to allow them to continue to do the things that we want them to do, particularly remaining active. And that that includes with the hands. Correct. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And could I come to Karen Pratt, please, our physiotherapist? Would you like to respond to that question, Karen? Uh, yes, um, thank you. And I think um, David gave a really nice definition of osteoarthritis flares, but I might build on that just a little bit. So David um, mentioned that you do have kind of your good and bad days, but a flare is a transient state that's different to your normal kind of good and bad days. Um, that um, is characterised by worsening pain. Um, it can lead to swelling, stiffness. It may impact on your sleep and activity levels um, and psychological aspects um, that can resolve spontaneously or lead to some other strategies to better manage the condition. So um, I think David was mentioning a few options. So I think one thing that's really important to note is to not worry. Um, 
an osteoarthritis flare will typically settle and you'll return back to your previous state of capacity. So it doesn't mean that your joint is deteriorating or that you're getting worse. It's a natural progression of osteoarthritis. Um, and then to keep moving. So you can break up activities. So in the short term, if you've got a lot more pain or limited capacity, um, you might consider um, the activities you need to do in your week. So a lot of people might be doing gardening or laundry and household chores. Um, and so you might want to break them up and do a little bit at a time and take some rest breaks. Um, and then there's also capacity to, to build on that option of ice packs and analgesias to maybe even use like a knee sleeve or a walking aid in the short term if you're not particularly feeling steady and you needed a little bit of assistance. Um, and the triggers is something which is a little bit more unknown. So I think the most scary thing is when it comes out of the blue and you don't quite know why, um, but just to know that this is normal and in some cases you might be able to identify some triggers that may have led to a flare-up. So if you've done an unusual amount of activity, which is more than what you can tolerate, potentially that can aggravate your joint and lead to a flare-up. Um, but yeah, there's a lots of different things in people's lives. And, and again, don't forget about stress and your psychological health or a, a poor night's sleep. They also can be triggers. Wow. And look, can I just ask you, I've reached an age where my uh, social media feeds are flooded with things about osteoarthritis and one of them are these sorts of gloves that don't have tips in them they're like tight gloves is there evidence to support that that sort of firm glove would help with hands um, look, that's a great question. I guess for my specialisation, I typically see people with hip and knee osteoarthritis. So I might potentially refer to either um, to David or to one of the other panellists that um, have a little bit more, I guess, treatment with hands. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, Professor Hunter, would you like to come in? Yeah, so thanks, Julie. It's a great it's a great question. And there's a lot of different types of therapies that are useful in the context of hand osteoarthritis that we may not necessarily use in knee osteoarthritis. So um, you, the use of um, finger splints, finger sleeves, gloves is quite frequent, particularly resting splints at nighttime to reduce the swelling that a person might might develop and the stiffness that they might wake up with. But similarly, there are functional splints that we often use for people that have had an osteoarthritis that are finding pain related to particular activities. And so we work really closely with hand therapists, both to provide this, the the splints, but also oftentimes specific exercises targeted to the impairment that a person might have in their hands. And so it's it's really important to be proactive about managing these conditions because there's a lot that can be done. And I think oftentimes the attitude amongst you know, you know the community and oftentimes even health professionals, unfortunately, is one of, oh, you're getting old, there's not much we can do, but there is a lot that can be done. So don't take this passively, get out there and look after it. And when you say a splint, is it like a wooden thing or is it, what does the word splint? So um, I guess the common the common ones we use is pretty much like a what we call a sock splint. So it's a, a neoprene customized piece of material that's quite thin and fabric and you can bend and move the finger within it. And so it's literally like wearing a sock over your finger. Um, another common one that we use for the base of the thumb is what's called a short opponent splint. And that's made of a a moldable thermoplastic material so that, so that it conforms to the thumb. It's a little bit stiffer, but it really helps to support the uh, the base of the thumb in a person that has um, particularly involvement of this joint down here, um, which in the context of hand osteoarthritis leads to a lot of impairments in in grip and, and other activities like that. So um, they're, they're not so as bulky or cumbersome as you have in mind, Julia. No, no, great. And, and what sort of clinician would you go to for that sort of hand help? Yeah, so it's a special physiotherapist or an occupational therapist called a hand therapist. And so there's there's a whole range of them out there in the community. They're wonderful, wonderful people, and they do a fantastic service. And oftentimes, most people, probably including yourself, have never heard of them. Um, but there's a lot that they can do to provide help for people like you. No, thank you. And uh, Dr. Bess, could you come in, please? Your comment on, uh, on yes. this question. Um, from an exercise perspective, often I don't see a huge number of patients with with finger and hand osteoarthritis, ba base of the thumb. So th that's very common. And um, what I'd like to just add is that for for play for for patients that enjoy racket sports or hitting sports such as tennis and golf, um, David mentioned grip, um, a change in the grip. 
often something very, very subtle, like increasing the size of the grip of your tennis racket, increasing the size of your golf grip from a medium to a large, and also some technical changes, depending on if you're right or left-handed and how much compression that is, that can actually eliminate people's pain. So don't feel that you've got to completely stop a sport because of that. Um, and you can actually do some of these sports with some of the splints that have been mentioned. That is so important, uh, Dr. Best, because for some people, look, I, I think of my late father who didn't have arthritis, but if he hadn't been able to play golf, I think a core purpose in life would have been eliminated. You know, some people really rely on their sport, don't they? And for, for a lot of things, emotional connection, outdoor activity, and just the love of it. It's one of the predictors of healthy aging. In fact, it's that connectivity you get with interaction in sport. In fact, this is a little aside, and I know uh, um, Dr. Alan Shell um, has had a, a strong golfing history, um, which means he's got a good sense of humour. There, there was a very large Korean study of 20,000 patients that was studied for about a decade and they looked at um, those, they matched them for their age and other risk factors for ill health. And one group, half of them were regular golfers, the others weren't. And after 10 years, those that played regular golf not only were fitter and maintained a healthier body weight, but they had less cognitive decline because of their social interaction and some of the arithmetic you do in golf, such as scoring in stable fit and so on. So that's a nice aside. And that's a good man, men's health story. You know, I know women play it as well, but it's a good men's health story. Look, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to come back to Alan Shell, and I promise Cody Kane from Walper, I'll bring you in shortly. But Alan, another question, please. Yeah, thank you, John. I agree. And I have larger grips on my club. Uh, I think it, the issue, as always, with m most of the questions is how do I stop the pain? Yeah. And pain management has got a lot of people into trouble with obviously some of the heavy drugs they get into but things such as does glucosamine work does serocumin work does the injection of platelet rich plasma uh, your own blood work um, does the overuse of steroid into the joint work uh, other than taking panadol osteo three times a day and there were some very common questions Thank you. Now, I'm going to come, uh, first of all, to Professor Hunter, if I may. And I can say from the prior questions, many of them related to pain. So what, what do we need to say to our people about pain? Yeah, so it's a really important question. And I really want to stress some of what um, uh, Karam was saying a moment ago, particularly around the core treatment. So even in the context of pain, it's really important for you to remain active and maintain good muscle strength and function, because that will help your joints long term. And ideally maintain a good, healthy, healthy weight. But there's a lot of other options that are available beyond that. And so, you know, we regularly use braces for knees, for hips, for hands. Uh, we frequently use modifications to shoes to help a person to mobilize more comfortably. Um, but obviously the genesis of the question, I think largely related to the use of drugs and supplements. So let's talk about those one at a time. So um, in the first instance, the first line analgesic, so the first line pain reliever recommended in most international guidelines is the, the group of medications called anti-inflammatories. So they can be given either topically or orally, uh, topically a, a, um, a gels and things like Voltaren or Feldine gel that can be rubbed on the joint two to three times a day will work equally well in hands and knees, uh, probably to a lesser extent hips. Um, and or oral anti-inflammatories. And so depending upon your comorbidity status there, particularly your risk of developing ulcers, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and strokes. And so it's important to do this in conversation with your GP and or a pharmacist about your safety profile and risk for taking an oral anti-inflammatory. But usually what we would recommend for people that have osteoarthritis, which is again a disease primarily characterized by fluctuations and flares, is the smallest dose for the shortest duration possible. So we're typically not prescribing this long-term. We're prescribing this for a short period of time. Occasionally, in some people, we might use an infrequent corticosteroid injection, but it's usually a third or fourth line. Um, I'll talk about supplements, and I'll talk about, I guess, the common medications that are frequently used inappropriately in the context of osteoarthritis. So the most frequent supplements that are used 
are the ones that probably are no better than a sugar pill. And I, I'm really sorry to tell everybody that. And I know many of you have probably spent thousands of dollars on these over a course of a lifetime. But the average person that has osteoarthritis spends about $1,600 out of pocket, largely on things like supplements every year. Uh, the most common ones are glucosamine and chondroitin, and there's good evidence to suggest that they're no better than a sugar pill. Um, fish oil, similarly, there's good evidence to suggest that it's probably not as effective as we once had hoped. There's preliminary and emerging evidence. And so I say preliminary and emerging. So I'm not coming out here to recommend or advocate for it, that things like curcumin, boswellia, pycnogenol, and MSM. And so if you want to look it up, there's a great systematic review, I'm somewhat biased, that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine a few years ago, where we reviewed all of these. Um, the problem is that the quality of the trials is such that at present, there are no international guidelines that have come out and advocated strongly for these agents, but there at least is some positive research advocating for that. And we're doing further research on those agents where there does appear to be some effects because there's such community interest in the use of supplements. So let's talk at least briefly about a couple of the agents that you spoke about in the context of that question, Alan. One was platelet-rich plasma. So this is a spun down portion of a person's blood, extracting the platelet rich layer of that blood and re-injecting that back into a person's joint. Widely done, expensive, and at least in the best done trial, which is something we published in the Journal of the American Medical Association a few years ago, no better than a salt water injection after three injections at 12 months for pain or for cartilage on MRI. So there are no guidelines that advocate for the use of PRP. There's lots of clinicians out there who make a lot of money from its use. Again, we would not advocate for its use for osteoarthritis. Opioids are used for about by about 20% of people that have osteoarthritis. The long-term evidence would suggest it causes a lot more harm than benefit. And I don't necessarily need to tell all of you about the community harms that are caused by opiate abuse, the number of deaths uh, that occur as a consequence of this. A lot of them stem from initial prescription for osteoarthritis, uh, which is, again, not doing our patients a service. I think I addressed all of the <laughs> portions of your question, Alan, but if I didn't, uh, just ask again. Alan, could I just bring in Cody Kane, please? And, and then I'll come back to you for another question. Uh, Cody Kane, as I mentioned, is a physiotherapist and he manages the Physiotherapy and Day Service at WALPA. And, and, and Cody, why I wanted to come to you at this point is that uh, there's been such a strong message from all our clinicians tonight that movement matters. And, and while we're dealing with this question of pain, I wonder if you could just give us an overview of the sorts of movement opportunities and guidance you've got at WALPA that help people to uh, to stay active. I, know. Um, I think it's very good information that everybody's provided so far tonight. I guess lots of people associate WALPA with the post-surgical side of things, but I guess years ago we started to realise with that market how much of a benefit we could have earlier in the process in avoiding surgery at the same time because it's not for everybody. And I think that's where we've always had our inpatients and our outpatients for post-surgical, but we started to go into more private services for physio or exercise physiology. We opened up some more classes within our pool. We have strength classes because it was getting people involved in activity. And some of those people had gone through one joint replacement that had given them the wake up call that, okay, I potentially don't want to do this again. And I think some of the good points that were made before were around people avoiding activity or the expectations of potentially they used to be a runner and all of a sudden they were having pain running. So then because they couldn't extract enjoyment because they weren't running, they weren't exploring other alternatives of movement. And then like Karen said, oh, it's kind of a vicious cycle. So then there's no movement happening. Then they get pain when they do try and move. They potentially see a health professional who says you just need more rest, you need more tablets, and then the cycle continues, runs down the cycle, and then they end up in surgery. So I think having a scale, so we run 59 classes a week now, with the aqua, the strength, balance classes. So I think the more people we have exercising, we found people are maintaining their level of function, they're avoiding surgery, they're potentially losing weight. Overall, the social interaction. So 
a couple of classes that stand out, come and have coffee before the class. The class is kind of the second part of what they do in that. So I think there's a lot of good information that's been provided and the services that we provide supplement, not the, just the surgical part, but also the pre-side or avoidance, maintenance, whatever you want to sort of phrase that to be. You've been from long psychologically difficult uh, when they face that change in their body and I wonder if you could speak to that and what you're able to do I guess you partly said it's about the group experience but it's similar to what I think Dr Best referred to which is that need to redefine your fitness goals yeah well I think there's there's probably a few of us that had aspirations to be professional athletes or do more exercise or things such as that and then it gets to a point where our, our body starts to, to fail us in some way and whether that's from pain or what it is but we start to notice a change in what we are physically capable of and then being able to reset our mind to do a potential activity or extract enjoyment from it to the same extent is very difficult and to have I think a good point that I want to stress is to have good people around you a good GP or a good physio who will listen to you and who will embrace you as a person as a whole and listen to you because too often it's you've got arthritis this is what you should do i don't want to know about your history i don't want to know these things i'm just going to tell you what you should do whereas when you have a genuine connection with a patient and you get to know about them and what makes them tick you're going to be far better equipped to give them advice and then you're probably going to have more carryover to what they're going to actually do and that's what we've found with a lot of our post-surgical patients, we've probably learnt a lot of lessons as to not only the evidence is there, but how valuable in a practical sense from their feedback as to, I wish I had known this before, I wish I had known this before, and would that have prevented them from having surgery? We don't know in that instance, but would there have been valuable tools they would have learnt? Most definitely, without a doubt. Thank you, Cody. I'll come back to Dr. Alan Schell, our question moderator. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thanks, Julie. No, sorry, uh, Professor Hunter. I think the last bit was about Duralane injections and also injections of so-called gels into the joint to try and replace the cartilage that's sort of missing. That was the end of that one. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of things that people stick into their joints. And I guess if I just want to summarize, uh, particularly around the use of a whole group of medicines called uh, hyaluronic acid injections. So hyaluronic acid is a normal constituent of synovial fluid, the fluid within a joint in the context of osteoarthritis that is diminished in concentration. And so there's a thought that if you re-inject it back in, that'll help with the lubrication of the joint and its function. The unfortunate thing is that you get basically close to the same effect with a saltwater injection. Um, but hyaluronic acid injections typically cost um, about five to six hundred dollars a piece. Oftentimes, they're given in a series of three injections, and again, they're not without side effects. So, about five percent of people develop an allergy to the main constituent of it, which usually leads to a very large red hot swollen joint for a period of time. So, generally, again, most guidelines are not advocating for the use of those visco supplements or hyaluronic acid injections, of which um, the ones that you're just mentioning, Alan, are, are fit within that group. Alan, I'll come to another question, if I may. Yes, um, I think it goes back to we talk about uh, one of the major causes you added was uh, weight control being overweight. So therefore, are there known restrictive diet, dietary supplements? Are there foods we shouldn't be having? The argument that tomatoes or red meat was bad for you? If you had arthritis, that sort of common type of question. Is my diet the cause? And how do I avoid arthritis in my eating what I'm eating, whatever I'm eating? Could I come to Dr. John Best on this one, please? Um, th thank you, Alan. Um, diet and weight are essentials of, of health and how we live. Um, I'm not really in a position to talk about uh, the chemical aspects of of, of dietary changes. I, I think I'd leave that to, to David. Um, if someone has a condition such as gout with their osteoarthritis, there are features there. But when you look at um, 
patients who are overweight or obese with osteoarthritis, particularly of the lower limbs, um, you, you need to talk about weight. And a few things, a few remarks I make now is not really to make anyone feel ashamed, but to really give you, I think, some ideas. So we know, uh, and David was an author of a very good article um, in the journal, I think, Osteoarthritis and Cartilage, looking at metabolism and arthritis. And in certain people, our fat cells, if you are overweight or obese, act like, act like an organ and they secrete chemicals that worsen inflammation in the body. So one of the problems with fat and weight is that you've got the mechanical effect on a joint. So in certain parts of the knee, you increase the load for every extra kilo you're carrying by some, somewhere between five to seven, depending on which part of the knee. So if you're 10 kilos overweight, it's like you're putting 50 to 70 kgs through that, that joint, a little bit less through the hip. Um, and then you've got the effect of fat itself. And so I talk to people a bit about um, how do they feel their weight is? What's their relationship with food? I, I don't use the word diet at all. Um, diets are very disappointing. There's not much... Um, there's not much research really that diets are sustainable. It's more about people's relationship with food. So one of the things we do see is this pattern of a patient who has osteoarthritis in the hip or knee. They're heavier than they should be. They know it. They don't need much reminding. They often have tried many things before, and they may have other what we call comorbidities, such as hypertension, cholesterol, possibly thyroid disease, and diabetes. And these people are often insulin resistant. And I think what works very well as a starting point is looking at what's called their carbohydrate intake. So we, we know, for example, that excessive sugar is not good. Everyone is pretty well in agreement on that. But carbohydrates, bread, pasta, rice, and certain vegetables such as corn, um, they break down into sugars, uh, certain fruits, fructose will do that. And then they have an inflammatory effect. And, and then I talk to people about how they celebrate with food and things like that. So, for example, in Jewish culture, um, Friday night family meal, the Shabbat is very important. You want to enjoy that. That's not the time to try a fasting program or something like that. But many people who are um, heavier, they're not, quite, they're not hungry in the morning very often. And so things like two meals a day as a, as a guide with a low carbohydrate and then working out what do you do if you feel a bit hungry. Uh, I found that many men can lose weight fairly quickly, a half to one kilo a week, not unusual, and some women as well. So I'm not a dietitian, but I, I, I do look at addressing that as a starting point. Look, thank you so much. And if I could come to Professor Hunter, your, your key message is about this weight loss because it clearly really matters when it comes to function. Is that correct? Yeah, both pain and function, Julie. Yeah. So, you know, I guess the key message is there just to really echo echo what John's saying is that so weight has an effect both on load um, in terms of mediating its effect. So um, that has a really important effect, but it also has an effect on creating circulating inflammatory molecules. And so that's why weight doesn't just have an effect on knee and hip osteoarthritis, but it also increases hand osteoarthritis. If we get a person who's overweight, and we've we've done this in a number of different trials now, to lose between seven and a half and 10% of their body weight, their symptoms should improve on average by about 50%. So it's easy for me to say, you know, lose 10% of your body weight and you'll get a 50% pain improvement. But I think it's really important. As John said, we don't stigmatize this. We'd be supportive as, as best we can, but I, I guess give people the information that they need to have, that it is related to their osteoarthritis and then I guess give them the tools so they can operationalize doing something about it. And so, for different people, it's going to be a different trick. So for some people, it might simply be a case of chatting to a dietitian, finding out what the problems are. It could be behavioral overeating. It could be portion sizes. It could be alcohol. If that's not going to work for them, the other thing that we we frequently do is put a person on a caloric restricted plan. So whether that be through um, certain meals that we provide people, meal replacements. And obviously there's a vogue these days towards using uh, pharmacologic agents to control weight and, and obesity surgery. But we don't really spend a lot of time uh, 
doing that at the moment. We really concentrate as best we can on the things that are likely to be sustainable for a person longer term, because we know they make a massive difference. The other portion of Alan's question, which I think is uh, really, really fascinating, and there's emerging evidence now about the role of what we might call anti-inflammatory style diet. So I guess the, the question started off with, you know, eliminations and nightshades and um, acidic foods and all of that sort of stuff, which plays no benefit at all for the purpose of osteoarthritis, okay, despite what the community might believe. But there is an increasing emerging evidence around the role of anti-inflammatory diets and so Mediterranean style diets, which tend to be more plant-based. So using seeds, nuts, grains, legumes, with the predominance of um, fish as a, as a type of meat, as opposed to uh, red meats that might be higher in saturated animal fats. So the omega-6 fatty acids, which we know are not helpful for inflammation and trying to promote more of the omega-3 fatty acids, which are present uh, within fish. So there's there's emerging evidence now that plant-based diets, particularly the Mediterranean diet, is helpful for symptoms in the context of osteoarthritis, quite separate from any benefits it might have for weight loss. Thank you so much. I, I'm We don't have a great deal of time left, but I, I want to invite uh, Dr. John Best back because uh, we have focused uh, very much on uh, lifestyle and behavioural change. I think the preferred term to, to non-surgical. But I just do want to just say there will be some people watching us tonight who may um, be considering surgery or it may be raised with them by one of their clinicians. And I've heard, uh, John, that you've actually had, I think, two hip replacements over time and members yes. of your family have. And I wondered if you could... Give us a sense of what are the questions, what are the issues that someone should discuss with their clinicians, the, mm. their health team, if the, if the issue of surgery as an option is coming up? Because you've been through it. Yes, thank you, Julie. So um, my, my story uh, briefly is uh, there, are, there are men in my family that were born with um, hips that had an abnormal shape, what we call dysplasia, where the ball and socket were incorrectly aligned, shallow socket, and then they grind down. And I didn't know this at the time, but it did explain why I couldn't do round the corner kicking when I was a boy. Uh, I was tight in the hips. And um, my right hip uh, became arthritic in my late 30s. And I had um, non-operative treatment. I was never overweight. I, I, I kept strong, but it really just wore down to what we call bone on bone. And and I must say, there were times at night where if someone said, um, you can have surgery tomorrow, it'll take your pain away, I would have signed up. So I subsequently did have surgery for that. And my left hip um, was eight years ago. I knew that was going to happen. And the type of surgery I had was called a resurfacing, uh, similar to the tennis player, Andy Murray. And in fact, if you want to watch a good Netflix documentary, there's one on him and his hip. Called, it's called resurfacing, and uh, it actually goes through how difficult it was for him to get the right diagnosis. But anyway, um, you go through some dark nights as a patient, that's for sure. Um, when you have to work, we had kids starting high school, um, you're taking time off. If you have an injection, you're wondering if you're going to be in that very, very, very small group that gets an infection, all these sort of things. And, and really... Um, I just became a patient and trusted the doctors I was with that made a big difference. I think that um, when I look back to the things that that helped me and now what I use for my patients, I, it's really all about resetting some goals. So I have implants in my hips that um, are really going very well. Um, there is a good chance that I'll need them redone depending on how old I am. But hip replacement surgery has a very high patient satisfaction rate. It's well above 90, towards 95%. It's different to the knee. As David says, 20 to 25% of patients are unhappy after knee replacements. But for me, it was starting some new sports. It was doing things that were lower impact because I wasn't going to run on roads again. And, um, and, and that has helped me regarding getting people to consider other forms of exercise uh, that are, are less impactful. 
So uh, for me, it was ocean swimming, um, which which I enjoy and do. It was paddling. It was doing a bit more boxing for fitness and so on. So really, um, you have people who are marathon runners or distance runners who were brought up doing team sports, and they they have to make some psychological changes in accepting that they have the disease, but at the same time, not lose hope that they can actually improve their fitness and their areas of strengthening with the right treatment. So for me, I'm an example of that. And um, I think it's helped me with my empathy a little bit. Um, arthritis pain at night is, is difficult to manage, that's for sure. Thank you so much, uh, uh, John, for, for telling us your own story. It obviously has a, a huge impact. Um, could, could I come to, to David Hunter, and I will also come to you, Karen, just that question uh, of if someone is considering a surgical intervention, what are the issues to discuss with their doctor? I guess particularly if it's a knee by the sound of it. Could I come to you, David Hunter? Yes, Julie, yeah, very happy, very happy to. So, um, I mean, I think in the first instance, um, as I as I tried to allude to, it, it needs to be done for the right person at the right time. So in general, what does that mean? So typically for joint replacement surgery, we're talking about a person who's got pain that's unresponsive to other interventions that's impacting upon their quality of life, and particularly if they're starting to develop rest pain. So those are the sorts of criteria that we often look at in terms of referring people off to see a surgeon. Um, and so, you know, let's dig a little bit more into that that aspect of, um, you know, what what characteristics do we look for both in a person that should be referred to a surgeon, but also what characteristics that might predict a person who's less likely to respond. And so there's lots of great studies and there's some wonderful research that's been led by Peter Chong and Michelle Darcy out of St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. So that's a surgical group down there that has essentially found that if you're depressed, if you're in what we call a morbid obesity group, so it's a body mass index above 40, if you've got little, if any, x-ray change of osteoarthritis and you've got a low pain score, it's much more likely that you're going to get a poor response to that surgical intervention in the context of knee replacement. So if, if you fit within that criteria, be very cautious about the surgery and really explore and examine the other things that could be being done about the management of your osteoarthritis through other means. I'll probably get Karen to comment on this because I think she'll do a much better job than I, but I guess the other key piece is to optimize your health, particularly your fitness preoperatively if you're going to go through with that surgery, but I'll let Karen speak to that. She's much more eloquent and smart than I am. Uh -huh. No, thank you. Welcome, Karen, because you'd be dealing with this in your work all the time, wouldn't you? Oh, thank you. Um, yes, that's exactly right. So um, I just probably need to say that I'm very fortunate that I work with a comprehensive multidisciplinary team and most people that come to my service are really motivated and engaged with a lot of the strategies that we were talking about with exercise and weight management and are trying to get fit for surgery because that's the big pitch at the moment with the hospitals is that, you know, you want to be ready for it. We want it to be the right time. But I probably should start by saying that patient education about osteoarthritis and about the joint replacement is really important and so we need to align expectations. So this is really important for an informed decision making in relation to the benefits and the risks of surgery and also the timing of surgery. And so we probably need to consider a few different questions. So I might propose some questions to consider um, if you're thinking about surgery. So, um, you know, do your symptoms stop you from doing the things you enjoy? That's an important one to note. You know, does your osteoarthritis stop you from leaving the house? You know, have you had to reduce or give up work due to your symptoms? Um, does it affect your sleep? 
And have you tried exercise and weight control and medications? And are you um, managing your medical conditions well, like type 2 diabetes as well, um, obviously managing um, cardiovascular disease? Um, and have you discussed this with uh, your doctor? And have you actually seen somebody to support you? Because it is hard to manage osteoarthritis. It's very disabling. And so it's really nice if you've got somebody that will support you and listen to your goals and what it is that you need for good quality life to really troubleshoot with you of how you can achieve that because it's not always at the forefront of your mind of how you adjust things or, you know, change kind of your expectations, particularly in those high level um, activities, which I think John was talking about before, how he adapted and changed his lifestyle. Um, and then I guess the other question is, um, are there other conditions that um, affect your mobility um, that won't be fixed by a joint replacement because we have a lot of other comorbidities or other problems and um, it's just really knowing what the intent of the joint replacement is. So one typical example of an expectation would be that some people um, really want to kneel after having a total knee replacement where that's not always easy after surgery. So we need to make sure that our expectations align with um, what we're expecting with surgery. Was that a fantastic summary? I do think some deaf sign clapping is required. That was just amazing. Look, we've, we've really nearly finished, but Alan, is there an issue on your sheet or in your own mind that is absolutely critical that we haven't done? We can just quickly do one more thing. Yes, I think for David, uh, the difference between osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile arthritis, because there seems to be I think some confusion in some of the questions uh, with regard to the differences and the treatments. Thanks, David. If you could yeah. be concise, that's a big question. Thank you. So I'll, be, I'll try to be very concise, and I don't mean to be a little bit blasé with the way I answer this, but juvenile uh, arthritis or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis typically occurs amongst a young younger group of population. So oftentimes it's characterised by... Um, sort of what we call an asymmetric oligoarthritis. So it's large joints, lower limbs, two to two to four joints, and sometimes inflammation in eyes. But it's usually a juvenile or a pediatric condition that typically doesn't last into adulthood. So it's, you know, you can see there's a difference as far as age is concerned. Um, for rheumatoid arthritis, the genesis of that is it's an autoimmune disease. So the body has developed antibodies that it's targeting towards yourself in this particular instance, the synovium or the lining of the joint. So that causes a local targeted inflammation that can cause damage to the joints. And so oftentimes it develops um, and it's a, what we call a bimodal incident. So it occurs uh, earlier in life. So it, particularly at the uh, sort of earlier age of 35 to 40, and then it has another peak later in life at usually about the age of 60. It's more common in women again, um, but it pre presents as an inflammatory arthritis and inflammatory pain. So pain oftentimes at rest with characteristic early morning stiffness in contrast to osteoarthritis, which again, the genesis of which can be genetically related, but more often than not is related to body weight, injury or occupation. Um, and typically affects different joints to those that are predominantly affected in, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, is associated with inflammation, but the primary genesis is mechanical in character and definitely doesn't have autoantibodies that are predisposing to its development and has that mechanical pain as opposed to inflammatory pain. Sorry, trying to keep it short. That was fantastic too. I think we'll give you some deaf sign. <laughs> Look, ladies and gentlemen, our time is up. I, I pride myself on always uh, finishing on time. And I, I I just want to thank on behalf of our audience, uh, our panel tonight, uh, Professor David Hunter, a rheumatologist and uh, clinical researcher, clinician researcher of the University of Sydney. Taryn Pratt, thank you so much. Our physiotherapist um, uh, coordinating the musculoskeletal program in the osteoarthritis chronic care program at uh, Royal North Shore Hospital uh, and also Dr John Best uh, a person with personal experience but also a specialist sports and exercise medicine physician who has done so much work with the wallabies and just we'll all pray for them for the future and thank you to Cody Kane uh, our, our physiotherapist and physiotherapy and day service manager at Walper um, it just was um 
so informative and I, I really thank you all. And uh, I'm very grateful. I haven't, I've resisted the urge to show you the funny kinks in my hands, but I've kept away from personal anecdotes. I'm very proud of myself. But I, I want to also thank very much um, Mr Sutherland Smith, who's still with us and who opened proceedings from Arthritis Australia. And we will be sending an email out with lots of links to your and other sources of information. And there will be a feedback form. Please fill in your feedback. They do listen and, and particularly uh, it goes to the question of what other topics will be covered. Remember, this has been recorded and will be on the Walper Jewish Hospital website. And our next session is Wednesday, the 5th of May, Wednesday, uh, the 5th of May, and it's Living with Parkinson's Disease, How to Stay Independent uh, and Live Well. My name is Julie McCross, and it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be with you this evening and to learn so much from our esteemed panel. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, good evening and good night. <laughs>